when we look at exercise, when we look at movement, one of the things that this study showed, and maybe some of you have seen it, it was published in the New York Times. Uh, The study was done over a period of time. It was published in September of 2021, but it really hit the mainstream just fairly recently, is that if you regularly participate in physical activity, not only does it make you feel better after you exercise, you get that boost, but it also serves to prevent the development of anxiety disorders over the course of your life. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Robin, it's the most wonderful time of the year. No, no, no. <laughs> Robin, I've got some interesting data for you. Okay. So this falls into the category of stuff that people know, but they don't like to hear. And so I'm just going to say it again. There's always new research coming out about this. And so I think it's something that, based on the fact that it's getting darker and colder outside, I think it's important to talk about. Okay. Lay it on me. All right. This is going to shock you. Exercise is good for you. (gasps) I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. So here's the thing. Like for a really long time, like decades, we've known that exercise is really helpful for our mood. You've heard about the runner's high and all that kind of stuff. But because people are struggling so much right now with anxiety and depression, They've been pushing out some more research that is not only saying that it's good for your mood, we also know it's good for your health and good for your brain and good for your heart, but that also it's preventative. And I think that's really something that we should talk about, not only for ourselves, but for our children. It's really important for people to recognize the power of movement and exercise. Because we have such a sedentary culture, I think the facts need to be laid out there. I think people need to hear them. Yeah. Okay. When we look at exercise, when we look at movement, one of the things that this study showed, and maybe some of you have seen it, it was published in the New York Times. Uh, The study was done over a period of time. It was published in September of 2021, but it really hit the mainstream just fairly recently, is that if you regularly participate in physical activity, not only does it make you feel better after you exercise, you get that boost, but it also serves to prevent the development of anxiety disorders over the course of your life, which is really important for people to recognize. Let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. With your knowledge of the physiology of anxiety, Uh why does it do that? Because if anxiety is rooted in so many mental patterns that we have, Mm -hmm. What is it about the physical component of exercise that disrupts those patterns? How do you think this breaks down? One of the ways it breaks down is there's the physiological part of it, but I also think that there's a whole nother part of it, the mental part of it, and also the social part of it. So I think it hits things on a lot of fronts, actually. The physiological part of it is that remember that anxiety is a very energized system, If you've got a lot of energy, if you've got a lot of adrenaline, if you've got those cortisol, all those hormones in your body, being able to use them, being able to activate them, being able to move your body and get things flowing is really helpful. We also know that when people are anxious, they tend to be very internally focused. So you're inside your head, you're ruminating, you're paying attention to your thinking, You also, for many people who are anxious, they have a pretty anxious relationship to their body. So they're thinking about their physical symptoms. They don't really trust their body. They see their bodies as defective or weak or there's something wrong with it. And when you're exercising, your body is working in a way 
that makes you feel good because your heart is pounding and your lungs are working and your blood is flowing and we're getting that increased oxygen to your brain. It helps your digestion, but also it makes you experience your body in a different way. And I think that has a lot to do with why it helps with anxiety. It also helps you experience your mind in a different way because Mm -hmm. as you're saying this, I think about how we feel at the beginning of a yoga class and how we feel at the end. Those first few minutes, unless you're someone who has really become a seasoned practitioner of meditation, we all have monkey mind at the beginning of something where we're supposed to not. But by the end of the class, usually we have left that place and we are more present and aligned with breath, for example. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure runners, they could be ruminating about something or wondering about something. But by the end of the run, they're in a very different thought process. That's right. And one of the interesting things about this study, they looked at people who had participated in this cross-country ski event, which was a yearly event. And it was a really large sample because they looked at it over a period of years and years and years. And so people who were participating in this event who were exercising on a regular basis, you didn't just show up once a year to participate in this event. So we knew that it was a lifestyle of these people. One of the things they found is that you were significantly less likely to develop anxiety over the course of your life if you were participating in it on a regular basis, except for one group of people. And these were the women who were the top finishers. So the women who were the top finishers in this event year after year, they did not get the benefit of developing less anxiety over the course of their life. They continued to ruminate. They were very performance focused. They didn't get the protection. They didn't get the prevention. Right. They're running or swimming or biking or competing alongside a perfectionistic tendency that's telling them they're not enough unless they hit a certain time. Right. I can tell you a story about this because I have competed in things for a long time. I don't compete anymore. And one of the reasons I stopped competing is that I didn't want to do that in my head anymore when I was exercising. So I remember I was training for this triathlon. You know, I just did it for fun. But again, like fun in finger quotes because we were all competing with each other. I was wearing a heart rate monitor. And I remember going out for a ride and I was really pretty tired. I really just needed to get out of my head. I really just needed to not think about all the things that I generally think about, nor did I need to think about what my heart rate was doing. And I decided at that moment, I didn't want to wear my heart rate monitor anymore. And I really shifted away from this idea that when I was working out, it was for some purpose other than I was doing something that made me feel good, that was fun, that was social that I could set goals for myself and really feel good about the goals that I was achieving. But I think that when we look at movement and when we look at exercise, the way that you can get trapped in it is that you're making it, like you say, you're not good enough. But the way that it becomes such a helpful thing is that you recognize the reason you're doing it is because it's good for your body. Because that heart pounding, you absolutely get the release of endorphins when you're exercising. And because after you're done, you feel good about what you did. And it doesn't have to be about all these numbers and all this competition. It really is about moving your body for a variety of different reasons. You know, before we go any further, I think we just need to clarify something for our listeners. Mm -hmm. You are an exerciser. I am an exerciser. You have taught, what, 5 a.m. spinning classes? (laughs) Yes. Right? And you have been a competitive athlete up until your heart rate monitor epiphany. Mm -hmm. So that is your context. Yes, that is my context. That is not my context. (laughs) Well, I just think I represent most of our listeners. (laughs) I mean, you're, you're, it, it, I love that about you. I admire that so much about you. And in fact, I was just remembering something that when we were still new sisters in law, yeah. and I was having babies and we both sort of had more of a similar approach to childbirth. And I remember you blurted out, you were like, it's a good thing we can talk about this because we can't talk about exercise. Oh, I said that? Like, it's a good thing we have that in common because for me, exercise, it's like I'm a cat going out in the rain. Mm. I haven't always been that way. 
way. It goes through phases, but you know, you write about this a lot in your new book, The Anxiety Audit, about self care. Mm -hmm. And when we have anxious responses where we don't do self care, when we come back, let's talk about for those of us where self care is an uphill battle. Yeah. Where exercising feels like a cat going out in the rain. How do you shift out of that? That's a really good image because I'm a cat person. We'll be right back. Okay. We like certain brands and certain things as a family, and I often go to three different types of grocery stores. With Thrive Market, you can shop for everything you need. You can get your healthy pantry essentials, your meat, seafood, non-toxic cleaning and beauty products. How about that? All delivered right to your door. And if you find a price that's lower elsewhere, Thrive Market will match it. Thrive Market carefully vets each and every item, so you can trust if they sell it, it's probably the highest quality available. They have over 5,000, 5,000 food, home, beauty products. Finding what you need is easy with Thrive Market. So if you're looking for plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, BIPOC-owned brands, Thrive Market has you covered with favorites like 7th Generation Cleaning Supplies and Bob's Red Mill Gluten-Free Flours. Get convenient, high-quality, affordable groceries delivered with Thrive Market. Join Thrive Market today and get a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks to get a free $60 gift. It's thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. We like certain brands and certain things as a family, and I often go to three different types of grocery stores. But with Thrive Market, I get everything I need in one place. I actually try to avoid going to one grocery store. So with Thrive Market, you can shop for everything you need. You can get your healthy pantry essentials, your meat, seafood, non-toxic cleaning and beauty products. How about that? All delivered right to your door. And if you find a price that's lower elsewhere, Thrive Market will match it. Thrive Market carefully vets each and every item. So you can trust if they sell it, it's probably the highest quality available. This is just so time-saving and money-saving because everything you need is easy to find on Thrive Market. You can filter 90 plus values and lifestyles to find what works for you. So if you want plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, Thrive Market has you covered. My gluten-free husband loves a good peanut butter sandwich. He has a very specific type of peanut butter, all clean ingredients. We've tried them all that we can get everything on Thrive Market. I think the thing that is really great for us is that I don't like using heavy chemical cleaning products. Like I just want to use the most natural cleaning products possible and they're right there. So I have a variety to choose from. No harsh chemicals. It works great. Get convenient, high quality, affordable groceries delivered with Thrive Market. Join Thrive Market today and get a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks to get a free $60 gift. It's thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, we're back. So Lynn, you can talk a little bit about the self-care pattern of anxiety, and then you use this great phrase, regret management. Mm -hmm. I just want to speak up for so many of us where maintaining our physical fitness and exercising with regularity is a challenge. The shame for those of us who don't feel like we're at our physical best, Mm -hmm. what it means like to live with all of that shame all the time, that we're not doing this stuff easily. It's a cobweb for a lot of us. And I think it's awesome that it isn't for you. I mean, I I think I'm more common, you know, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me address kind of the way that you can get out of the cobwebs a little bit and to talk about this that really is, is what I want this to be about, which is how can you make sure that you're moving your body in a way that really is about self-care and prevention? Because I think what you speak to is very common which is that it's really easy to talk ourselves out of doing this. And if you don't enjoy it, if it's not something that you look forward to, if you don't say to yourself, oh, I can't wait until I go on my run at the end of the day, or I can't wait until I get to do this physical activity, you've got to change your mindset so that you are operating in a place at the beginning, at the start, because I guarantee that if you keep doing it, you're going to get the perks and it's going to get easier. 
is that you've got to operate in that way of regret prevention. So what you want to do is you want to focus on the feeling of finished. You want to focus on the fact that if you get started and if you find something that you enjoy, the other thing I want to be clear about is that you do not have to train for a triathlon to get the benefits of exercise. You need to go for a walk. You need to get outside. I mean, even getting outside and moving your body is so beneficial. Talking about the sunlight in your eyeballs and getting some fresh air. I don't actually want this to be about one's physical body at all, actually, because I know that it really benefits that, but I really want it to be about the way your brain works when you're sedentary versus the way your brain works when you're getting activity, when you're getting motion. So the goal is to think not to go after it in a way that says, oh, I have to make my body better. I have to get in shape. I have to be this. I have to be that but start using words that really make this a reward rather than a punishment. I hear what your intention is. I'm just trying to speak for the listeners who hear this, who they may intellectually hear what you're saying, but they have layers of regret, layers of complicated feelings they need to work through or skip over or ignore, you know, in order to get to this place which can be done. I speak from experience. It absolutely can be done. Yeah. If you were to say, if I were interviewing you about this and you were to say, you know what? I used to be the cat going out in the rain. The idea of going out and exercising or working out, oh, that was just like, I might as well be going and getting a cavity filled. What do you think changed? Because I know you think about it differently. I do. If somebody were to say to you now, Robin, how do you feel about exercise? What would you say? Well, you know what I want to say before I say that? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think what I'm about to say, my husband said this to me once as a mom with young kids. Mm -hmm. He said, and it wasn't in a mean way, it was just an observation. I think this is very relatable. I think it feels like you have to have every star align for you to go and work out. Mm -hmm. Everything had to be perfect for me to finally say, like, I could go work out because the kids had to be in a certain position uh, or, or in a certain situation. The weather had to be a certain thing. Because it was so easy to come up with the reason why being home with little kids, particularly, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. But I finally recognized that I need connection when I move my body. And so now I understand that. And that's what I do. I know that exercise for me has to involve other people. Mm -hmm. And so I have a great walking buddy and we talk and talk and talk about all sorts of interesting things as we walk our miles. I work out with someone as well when I lift weights. So we're chatting away to, I just learned if I'm by myself, I'm going to do something else. That's a good point about in terms of you're using exercise as a way to socially connect and also as a way to get out of your head. Because if you're by yourself and you're just going to ruminate, you're just going to think about things. If you went for a long walk by yourself, I know you, you would be thinking about what project you're working on or what you have to get done you would have a working walk. And actually, you can really make fun of me now. During the pandemic, in the beginning, we were all walking all the time. But then like after that winter, right? And it was like, I got to get back out there again. I even proposed for other colleagues in my field, would you like to have a working walk? We'll talk on the phone about our work while we go walking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there are people who walk on treadmills while they're doing their work, right? So they're like, okay, so I can combine walking on this treadmill with working. Now, that's better than nothing, but I think that a big important part of this for me and for a lot of people is that you're not trying to fit this exercise into the things that other people demand of you. You're actually saying, I'm going to take care of myself in this way. And so you do it in a way that's pleasurable. Like you, like looking forward to going and talking with your friend and being able to have that social connection. Versus saying, I'm going to fit in this exercise in, but I have also have all these obligations that I have to get done. So really saying like it is about self-care. Self-care is something that you do for you that in the long term, not only makes you feel better as a human being, it makes you a better parent, it makes you a better friend. That's why when I talk about self-medication, self-medication doesn't fit that criteria. Self-medication you do to get rid of something, to not feel something. 
to get away from something. And generally you feel regret after you engage in self-medication. You don't feel regret after you engage in self-care. A lot of people will try and fit their exercise in and there are all this criteria that they have to fit. Like the kids have to be fed. There has to be a certain amount of time. I have to be wearing certain clothes to do it. In other households, it might not be about exercise. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. All the stars have to align for something else to happen. Yeah, that's right. If you can be more flexible about it, because remember, when we're talking about these patterns, we're talking about rigidity right? We're talking about rigidity. Right. As a mom, if you're like, I have to have all these things happen in order for me to do that, that is approaching it from a place of rigidity. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that if you were somebody who used to work out in a way before you had kids, right? So maybe you were an athlete in high school and college, or maybe you were training for something and then you have kids. Remember that anxiety also wants you to be all or nothing about it. So you think, well, I can't run the way I used to run, or I won't have time to do the workout I used to do, and then you do nothing. It really is okay. And one of the things that I have found as I've gotten older, and certainly when I'm on the road and I'm traveling, the only goal for me is to just make sure that my head is where it needs to be. And I can do that in a short period of time. You have to just think about it as, a, as something that you do consistently, something that you do for you. Something that you also do for your family, because self-care is family care too. You're a better human being when you're taking care of yourself. But think about how you're going to move your body in a way that just gives you whatever lift or boost you need. I guarantee you, you will feel better if you move your body versus if you choose not to. You just will. The anxious patterns that interfere with our self-care The other thing for people who are focusing on what they're doing for eating, if they break a diet or a meal plan or an intention, then they're like, ah, screw it. I messed it all up. So I'll start again tomorrow. There are these patterns of rigidity that are sabotaging your self-care, probably in a lot of different categories, potentially. It's like you said at the beginning, like everybody knows you're supposed to exercise. So then the question becomes, what gets in the way of that? To your point, if we say, well, what gets in the way of that is I have kids or my job is too busy or whatever, let's look at what gets in the way of it in terms of your anxious pattern. Are you all or nothing in your thinking, right? Are you too global? Are you too rigid about the way you're going to do it? Are you too catastrophic? So you think, oh my gosh, if I'm away from my kids and they need me, then I'm a terrible mother. So I have to be available all the time. So we could take every one of the patterns that I talk about and apply them to all sorts of self-care exercise, eating right, or sleep even, or our social connection. When we turn to our anxious patterns and say, what do you think, anxiety? Could I fit this in? Or is this something I should do? Anxiety will come up with all sorts of reasons about why you shouldn't do it. And that's what you have to pay attention to. I will admit I'm not passionate about it the way you are with such consistency. But the more you do it, the more you like it. And then there have been periods of my life when I did it a lot. And then when I didn't do it, I actually craved it and wanted to do it. Yes. The thing that you talk about of like you stopped your heart rate monitor tracking, Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting because I'm kind of the opposite where I need that data on my watch. It motivates me. Yeah. Because I'm obviously not doing it in a level of performance you're like, I got to do better. I'm like, hey, I'm just here. (laughs) I'm pretty easy on myself with the data. And so I think that's another interesting question is if you have the kind of watches that track or heart rate monitors, et cetera, for me, my data tells me, hey, at a girl, good job. You did it. It helps me say like, look, I did this. I'm doing it. Whereas you were saying like, do it harder, do it stronger. (laughs) Right. So that's a good question too of like, is tracking it a healthy thing for you? Well, and I think that's the question to ask. Does it add to your self-criticism or does it add to your self-support? In anything that you track, right? If you look at that information and the response you have immediately is like, oh, that's not good enough. Or if you look at that information and you say, this is so helpful because it's keeping me going. It's so inspiring. I like trying to keep this streak going that I walked a mile every day or something like that. Pay attention to the way you respond to that data. If it's helpful, keep it up. 
if it's a way for you to feel less than, if it's a way for you to criticize yourself, if you get into that whole social comparison stuff with it, then let it go. You've got to pay attention to what that data does. And having spent a lot of time with people who are completely caught up in the data, I tend to see it as not so helpful. I tend to see it as a way to feel like I'm not doing enough or a way to feel as if I'm not living up to my expectations of my younger self. I've just gotten rid of it. I'll tell you that on my phone, when I'm out walking or whatever, it is fun to kind of see how far I walked. I never look at it and say like, oh, let me compare last week to this week. It's just kind of interesting. Oh, how long did that walk take? I guess there's sort of two camps really here that if you're new to exercise or if you're a cat going out in the rain and you can find something that's motivating for you, that it's fun to track, that it's interesting, that it's different, then go for it. If you are somebody who tends to be self-critical about it, if it's caught up in old competitive stuff, then let it go. Let it go. I think a lot of people actually listen to podcasts when they go for walks by themselves too. I do do that. If my friend isn't available, we get feedback that people say they put us in their pocket and they go on the walk. Yeah. So for all you listeners right now who are out on your walk, hello, we see you. Hello, hello, walkers. (laughs) I listen to a ton of podcasts when I'm out walking. I use exercise as a way to get out of my head. My sister recommended a podcast that I listened to, and I tried to listen to it this weekend when I was walking, but it was too much about my profession. So I said to her, oh, that's really interesting, but I'm not going to listen to it right now. And then I switched over to listen to when Stefani was talking about her dyslexia. I use it as a way to disconnect from the stuff that my brain is, is sort of immersed in, for sure. Well, let's take a break. And when we come back, let's talk about, as parents exercise patterns that we want to model for our younger kids, but also how exercise can remain healthy through the ages. Gifting is hard. Bombas makes it easy with socks, underwear, and t-shirts that feel good and do good. They feel good because they're thoughtfully designed with the softest materials, and they do good because for every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone in need. I love this about Bombas because my kids have always known that their stocking every year is filled with underwear and socks. And I love the fact that when we do this, we're actually helping families in need. Yeah, I think it's a sign of getting older that I am thrilled when I get underwear and socks these days. And if I'm going to get Bombas, all the better. Bombas socks, underwear, t-shirts, and slippers are cozy upgrades to everyday basics and the perfect gift for everyone on your list including yourself. Bombas uses materials like premium Pima cotton and ultra soft, never itchy merino wool in their socks and t-shirts and fuzzy Sherpa lining in their slippers. Bombas holiday collection puts a modern twist on traditional festive colors and designs. With family sets, you can match everybody up in exceptional comfort and style and hello, frameable holiday gift photo. (laughs) And did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items in homeless shelters. That's why Bombas donates one item for every item you buy. So far, Bombas has donated over 75 million items of clothing. That's a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of good. Go to bombas.com slash flusterclux and use code flusterclux for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash flusterclux, code flusterclux for 20% off Bombas.com slash Flusterclux, code Flusterclux. This episode is brought to you by delicious Bear Snacks. Between cryotherapy, goat yoga, and smoothies made with things you can't even pronounce, wellness can feel a bit complicated. But there's a simpler way to wellness. Bear Snacks. They're a tasty, crunchy snack made simply of apples. With Bear Snacks, less is more. Buy Bear Snacks now at most grocery retailers nationwide. Okay, we're back. Okay, so Lynn, I remember when I was a new mom and there were all of these stroller fitness variations, like stroller fitness classes and things. <laughs> like there are certain moms where doing that sort of stuff was just easy and fun. Mm-hmm. And then there were other moms where that was being a cat going out in the rain. Mm-hmm. 
So it's like, hey, for all of those fellow cats, how's that <laughs> working for us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we still have to model exercise in a healthy way. And I know that kids are really watching more of what we do and not what we say. Mm -hmm. So what are some tips there? You know, I talk a lot about the values that you want to promote in your family when we're talking about good mental health. Like I always talk about how do we promote the value of flexibility in a family? How do you model that? I like to call it with families. I like to talk about activity. I just like to talk about moving. One of the things that I would say to parents is that you should really pay attention. If your child is spending the majority of his or her time indoor sedentary, then you've got to say, okay, so what are we going to do in order to get outside? What are we going to do in order to get this family moving? That may mean that you have to start going for walks with your kids. When they're little, if you are taking them places, if you are letting them run around, remember, unstructured play is really great. One of my dreams would be that families would really promote the idea that as part of our normal routine, we brush our teeth, we read together, and we also make sure that we get outside and move in some way. The earlier you start that, the better for sure. You know, and it's hard right now with screens and they want to be in their rooms and on their phones. If you've got older kids that are really not moving at all, I would have a conversation with them. And I would say, look, you've been talking to me about how your mood is kind of crappy, or you've been talking to me about how you've been struggling with friendships, or I hear you stressing out about your homework. And I, as a parent, really want to let you know that there are a few things that are really important for your body and your brain and your mood. Moving your body is one of them. So let's figure out how we can move your body and I'll help you. Let's go for a walk together or let's find something that you are willing to do. Because when we say, let's find an exercise you enjoy, some kids will be like, I don't enjoy any of it. But really put it in the context that you are being a loving, caring parent by making sure that they are practicing what I like to refer to as good mood management. Now, there are some kids that are going to absolutely say, no way, there's nothing you can get me to do to move. I could talk to you about how you force a 15-year-old to exercise. It's not going to work. So really, you've got to model it. And the earlier, the better. You've got to value it. If you are a parent of kids, like say you've got elementary school age kids, and you are going out for a walk, when you come back, talk out loud about how good that felt for you. I was just about to say that because even if you're a parent who doesn't necessarily exercise every day, when you do exercise, verbalize how great you feel for your kids. Yeah. And come back in and say, you know, say to your partner, oh, I just went for a walk with my friend and oh my gosh, we had such a great conversation. It was so good to be outside. I just feel so much better. Let kids hear that from you. Because remember, they're watching you and they're, they're forming their conclusions based on the conclusions that you're coming to and what you're verbalizing. They're not going to know that if you don't say it out loud. What they might notice is that when you exercise, you're in a much better mood. Some kids will say like, oh God, I can tell that mom hasn't been out on a walk recently, or I can tell that mom hasn't gone to her exercise class or whatever. So kids do notice that. But with little kids in particular, all kids really, talk to them about how it feels good to you, what the benefits are so that they can understand it. It's the same thing if you got a really good night's sleep. If you said to them, oh, I'm so glad that I just turned off the TV and went to bed last night early. I feel so much better when I get a good night's sleep. They're paying attention to all of that stuff. They will not do it if you don't do it. They will not do it if you don't let them know the benefits of it. They will not do it if they don't see you enjoying it too. Come back in with a smile on your face. Oh, that felt so good. Can we talk about what if you have kids who are competitive athletes and you want to make sure that they are managing their sport in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. We talked about some spring break story in some other episode, and you were referencing a friend of yours who had to go for runs. Like you can be rigid about your exercise too. You can get a little unhealthy about your exercise. Like in anything, you can become obsessive about this and it can become an addiction because the body responds to it and then you get caught up in, I have to do more and more and more. The story you were telling was about the person on the spring break and she had to get her run in and so she wanted to run to the airport when we were on <laughs> spring break. So certainly there's a dark side to this too, just like in anything, 
what you want to help your kids recognize, and this is, you know, is that perfectionistic thing with homework or with exercise. How do you recognize when you've done enough? And one of the things we want to pay attention to is that there is a culture of more, 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 that we're going to practice more, we're going to do more. There's a lot of emphasis on outcome. You know, you have to compete at this level. It is really helpful if you can introduce your kids to the idea that we exercise because it's fun and because it's a way of connecting. Competition can be fun. I love to compete. I still am competitive. I've talked about that. I have a competitive side to me. But how do we know when enough is enough? I will tell you that my history of being in competitive athletics and being around people who are really neurotic about it, that I know that well. I know how easy you can get hooked into that. I actually was listening to Martina Navratilova because I was a tennis player. And Martina Navratilova was saying in some interview after she had retired, she said that one of the things that she discovered was that rest is as important as her activity level. That if she was going to compete at a certain activity level or if her body was going to be able to function, that she really needed to focus on rest. I remember that very vividly because that was the first person I had ever heard talk about that. It's more common now for us to talk to young athletes about recovery, rest and recovery, but it's really helpful for you to use that language with your young kids. How do you know when your body's had, had enough? How do you know rest is an important part, an integral part to what you're doing and recovery? As soon as they can hear that, it's really important. And if your kid is in an activity where there's a coach or there's an environment in which it's all about push, 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 pull them out, get them away from that. It's not healthy and it won't get better over time for sure. If you're noticing that, it won't get better. I could just imagine there are some listeners whose kids are competent athletes and they are in competition and they are striving for some sort of best or some sort of so speak to that a little bit more because I can imagine some families resist what you just said. Yeah, I can imagine that too. I would have resisted what I just said 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You want to talk to your kids about the warning signs. You want to pay attention to the warning signs. You want to look for chronic injuries. Is your child getting injured a lot and are they pushing through injuries when they shouldn't? Are they beginning to dread going to practice? Has it become a source of stress for them so that before a competition, they're vomiting, they're not sleeping? If your child is on a swim team and they're vomiting before every swim meet, you got to pay attention to that. Swimming is fun. I love to swim. But when we get to the place where this sports and this competition is paying such a price on your kid's mental health, you need to back it off. And I will tell you, here's what I hear from a lot of parents parents that are perfectionistic, parents that push, they will say to me, it's not us. This is totally driven by them. That's not an excuse because a 13-year-old who is in gymnastics, who's developing an eating disorder and has stress fractures in both of her feet is not capable of making a decision about what's good for her and what's not good for her. So pay attention to those warning signs and look for them. Look for a social environment, a competitive environment in which kids are being pushed beyond the point of what you see is healthy. And if you recognize that, you can talk to the coach, but you may have to talk to your child about making a switch. I've had plenty of kids through the years that have left one dance studio to go to another dance studio because they recognize the environment was just not healthy. Or they love doing gymnastics, but not 10 hours a week when they were in second grade. So parents, sometimes you got to check your own selves here, recognize what the warning signs are and pull it back. Yeah, you know, we have episodes about the toxic achievement culture where we're usually talking about grades, but this applies to sports too. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. There are very few kids that are going to be professional athletes. There are also very few kids that are actually going to get athletic scholarships. That's way overblown in our culture. Being able to recognize that if your child is not having fun in what is supposed to be a fun activity, then you've got to reassess. And it's also okay for kids to switch activities and try different things. So if talking about kids being physical and kids being active, they don't have to pick one thing 
and stick with it. They can play around with it. They can do baseball and then they can try frisbee and then they can do pickleball and then maybe they want to do jujitsu. Let your kids play around. It's supposed to be play. And the benefits come from it being playful, not from the achievement of the physical activity, but from the physical playfulness and the social connection. That's where we see the benefits. So give us a mantra to help increase physical activity for the purpose of what? Joy and connection. I mean, that's really what it's about, right? Yeah. And about prevention too. Remember, we started off talking about the fact that the research is showing that physical activity prevents depression and prevents anxiety. Not only is it helpful if you're experiencing it. Here are my two things. One is that if you have trouble getting started, I think what you said, Robin, is so important. It's not about perfection. It's not about everything aligning. Just get started. Take the time. It matters if you do a little bit. Consistency matters. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Are we talking about exercise or sex now? Um, it sounds like we could be talking. You can, whatever you want to insert, no pun intended, whatever you want to insert into that, you can, you can insert whatever you like to insert. Yeah. <laughs> My mother-in-law gave me a banana slicer and you, and the directions, the directions on the banana slicer were, there were three words, insert, squeeze, enjoy. Okay. I just like to bring that up whenever possible. Okay. So the one thing is it doesn't have to be perfect. Like take it when you can get it. Okay. So do with that what you will. Then the other thing is focus on the feeling of finished, which again, could be applicable <laughs> to many <laughs> circumstances, right? Yeah. So take it when you can get it and focus on the feeling of being finished. And I think that will make your life better. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent with sometimes hilarious and always thought provoking experts and friends at Mindful Mama. We know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.